Robinson he even went down the sideline and he's got Cass Decker bringing you UCLA football content all throughout the year for LA Football Network. What's up, Bruin Bible listeners? This is your host, Will Decker. I uh, wanted to reach out and say thank you guys for all the listens, all the love. We see it on social media, we see it on YouTube. It has been sensational. And we want to encourage you guys, if you guys are enjoying the podcast and liking it, that you guys subscribe and like it, uh, whether it's on YouTube, on our UCLA LAFB channel, or the Bruin Bible, uh, to subscribe either through Spotify, Apple Podcasts, however you guys listen and react to it, because it's going to allow us to do much greater things in the future. We're creators. We want to be giving the best Bruins content to all of our UCLA listeners. The only way we can do that is if we have a fan base that is locked in and helping us out. So we appreciate you guys. We love you guys. If you guys have been liking it, please help us out with a like and subscribe button. What is up and welcome to a brand new edition of the Bruin Bible. Starting your week off on the right notes, Will Decker, your host, joined by your co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, the man to my right, Mr. Madman. What's going on, brother? It's great to see you here on this Tuesday evening. Great to see you as always, Thriller. Tuesday evening, always fun to get into it with you. I I, I feel like, you know, we do this a lot, but for whatever reason, it feels like it's been a while since you and I have chatted. For whatever reason, I don't know if it's kind of the new year or, uh, you know, some some things that have sort of already started happening in the new year, but it's it's such a delight to, to be able to do this with you, brother. Man, super excited. We're going to be talking hoops to start us off, man. We're really excited. For those that do not know, we are doing basketball now for UCLA, which is very, very uh, you know, momentous swing for us moving forward. And then we're going to talk about some of the football transfers, a couple heartbreaking losses, a couple of additions. I'm not in totally crazy about them on paper, but we'll see how they play out. But before we get into that, man, we got to go to our two sponsors for today. Bet Online. This is where the gaming starts. Make sure you use code LAFB on Bet Online. And how about Underdog Fantasy, man? Underdog Fantasy, you use the promo code UCLA LAFB. You guys get a match for how much you guys get to use in terms of gambling, place, placing prop bets, the whole nine yards, up to $500. I'm going to give you my pick of the week, man. I got DeMontis Sabonis going lower than 46 and a half points, rebounds and assists. Desmond Bain on the lower of seven assists. I feel like that one's a lock. He's more of a shooter. And then Isaiah Livers lower than three and a half rebounds. That is my parlay for the NBA Woo! for underdog fantasy. Make sure you use that code UCLA LAFB. Well, Madman, we uh, we have been kind of struggling on the basketball court, to put it lightly, man. It's been a rough go. That might be the but, understatement of the year, Will. <laughs> <laughs> struggling is an understatement. We just lost to a team that went 3-29 and last year in the Cal Bears, 66-57. to They started the game off on a 9-0 run. Um, we got ourselves back into the game. You know, we made some plays, but it just seems like Cal made timely three after timely three in the second half to really put us there. And, you know, the, the struggles aren't new, man. I mean, Cal shot 40% from three, a, a number they probably did not even hit last year at any given time. And we shot 20% as a team when it came down to it. We got out rebounded 39 to 26 on the glass. You know, the look, the look for a point guard out there, someone to set up the offense and get it rolling just is not there at all. There's no semblance of any offense out there on the floor, the hardwood for the Bruins. Just a lot of struggles going on there, man. Give me your takes on what we've seen thus far and how much it's been just a, a struggle for UCLA as we start this year. Yeah, well, it's such a great point. I mean, it's been a slog. I mean, there's just really no better way to put uh, put it than that. I think Mick Cronin kind of said it best is that, you know, in the, in the NBA and in college basketball and in just, you know, high level basketball, you have to score. You know, even even in the in the NFL and in college football, if you have a great defense, look, we saw what Michigan was able to do last night with a great defense. You don't always have to be prolific on offense. You just sort of have to do enough if you've got great defense to be able to win. Basketball is a different sport in that regard where you can be a dominant defensive team, but you still have to be able to score in a multitude of ways and in different circumstances because the game has ebbs and flows and has runs. And that's just very unique to that sport. And when you look at UCLA right now, I think there's kind of three elements here, Will, 
that continue to rear their ugly head game after game. And now, you know, we're staring at a six and nine season here, one and three in, in, in sort of conference play to start. Thriller, we, we sort of joked, you know, just to bring some levity here, 29 game home winning streak. Uh, you and I then decide to branch out into basketball instead of football. And we've been gifted the Christmas gift, the New Year's gift with four consecutive home losses and yeah. losing seven out of eight. So it's it's been sort of a rough transition here to begin. But number one, first and foremost, Will, you said it, the lack of a point guard, the lack of a floor general to be able to set the offense and give it an identity has just been missing all season. When you look at kind of this this construction of this roster, particularly in the backcourt, only one player, Will, is averaging more than two assists a game on this roster, and that's Dylan Andrews at 3.6. But then when you couple that with Andrews' struggles shooting the ball, 36% from the field, 25% from three, it's really hard to set up an offense the right way. It just seems like the two kind of go-to plays for UCLA are kind of force-feeding Bona and Burke at the beginning of games to kind of establish some rhythm. And then when challenges arise and you need a bucket, it's kind of, hey, give the ball to Sebastian Mack and just let him try and go create something. Let him throw his body in the paint and try and get some tough layups, some tough and ones, get to the free throw line. But that's just not a recipe for consistent success moving forward. So the lack of a floor general has just kind of created such instability and flow in the offense that it's really evident. Number two, Will, and a related point is the lack of shooting. I mean, we've talked so much about you know, mentioning Andrews' statistics, Stefanovic's struggles uh, shooting the ball. McClendon started strong, but, you know, has tapered off a bit. And then Sebastian Mack is more kind of a slasher than he is a shooter. And when you just have a lack of shooting, the challenge there becomes teams are just going to continue to pack it in. They're going to play zone. They're going to pack in the paint. They're going to clog the middle, make life difficult from a spacing standpoint for the likes of the Adembonas and the Burkes and sort of dare these backcourt folks to be able to shoot the ball and knock the ball down consistently from the outside. And they just haven't been able to do it. And then third will I think has been just in terms of overall roster construction and rotations. And I think you and I have sort of talked about this really interesting ideas of what's the five that you need to sort of put out there. And for me, after watching this team for 15 games, I don't think you can play two bigs. I think, you know, Cronin has sort of tried that first with Ade Mara and Bona and now with Burke and Bona. And I think there's been really nice flashes, but I think they have to go to a world now with one big and I think they have to spread the floor even more. And I think where Mick has to really look moving forward is kind of more of a three guard lineup with the likes of, you know, Mac, Andrews, McClendon, Stefanovic, pick three of those four at any one point. And then rotate Bona and Burke with each other as kind of the one big down low. And then, Will, I'm going to give you an off-the-ball suggestion here. I think Jan Vide or Ilan, you know, needs to be kind of that point forward, you know, and kind of play the role of the Draymond Green, if you will, for UCLA. Because if the offense isn't going to be run traditionally from a point guard, I actually think Vide and Ilan at 6'6", 200, each of them kind of have the ball skills and the creativity to actually kind of play that point forward role. I think things will start opening up as a result from the outside and just having one big on the floor. You may give up some size in terms of rebounding, but I think the gain that you get in terms of opening up the floor and putting more pressure on the defense in terms of being able to score the ball could really revive this team. So that's kind of my state of the team right now, Will, in terms of these three key areas. Yeah, I think you made a lot of really solid points there, man. And, you know, Burke had probably his roughest game with these amount of minutes. He got 20 minutes on the floor, one of six. But he's one of the guys that I would just encourage to keep shooting. Because Absolutely. for this game, he had a very efficient back-to-back double-digit scoring, you know, matchups that he had against Oregon. And I believe it was, was it Stanford before that? So Stanford and Oregon. So he was playing very well. He struggled this past game. He's one of six from the floor. And the guy that I just can't get out of my head, Stefanovic, has been struggling so much. He actually made his only attempt from three. Like, so keep feet. Like, at that point, you got to keep feeding him because, you know, Stefanovic really has a chance to swing some of these games if you can knock down your two to three three-point shots 
a game. You know, so he's one of one. I think his confidence is really shaken. He was on the floor for 26 minutes. He only took three shots. So he's been in a slump of all slumps. So you can tell he's not really feeling himself as much as he used to be able to when he was taking shots to 10 or 11 attempts per game going into there. I think you brought up a good point with Dylan Andrews. It's funny that he is our best passer because he looks to me as your ultimate score first six man type of guy. So if he's leading the team in assists, that's a very chaotic statistic there. And I think how I would run this offense, I'm with you. I think we got to get some size out there. You know, Bona, maybe that means decreasing Bona's minutes. I'm a little worried about what that would mean for the rebounding situation. I mean, Cal out-rebounded us by 13 rebounds this game. What's going to happen when we play some of the bigger dogs within the conference? I think I think we got to just run the offense through Sebastian Mack. Pick and rolls at the top. And then just put Dylan Andrews in the right corner and Stefanovic in the left corner and see what happens. It's very simple, but I really don't – I think that's the most effective way to generate offense right now. Whether it's between Burke and Bona, and maybe you can just have you know Bona run to the rim as a rim runner, throw the alley oop to a, you know Bona, or toss it down to him low, or Burke maybe you can get him at the free throw line, hit a nice lefty jumper. But man, it is so bad right now. I think I would actually make Mac the primary ball handler, and with those pick and rolls at the top and running the offense through him. Not only do you have your best scorer out there, but you can enhance him to just run the offense and make the plays needed. Do you think that's a crazy sentiment? No, Will. I mean, I think it's it's a very interesting blueprint and one that has a tremendous amount of, of logic and sense. Essentially, what you're describing is you want UCLA to become the 2017-2018 Houston Rockets, right? Exactly. Where, where Sebastian Mack is James, James Harden. Harden. You know, you got him as your primary playmaker at the top of the key. You've got Bona as, as sort of your rim runner, kind of in that Clint Capella role. And then, you know, some combination of Stefanovic, McClendon, Andrews, you know, are kind of your Eric Gordons and, you know, all your your Ryan Andersons and, and your shooters, and, and you spread it out. And so I think there's a lot of credibility there. It would involve, I think, Mick to think a little bit more in terms of pro style from an offensive standpoint, which I think is probably the right thing to do here. I think the question is, does he have the willingness to sort of break some of those behaviors and go and do that. And I think, Will, it's it's really an interesting point and one that I, I completely agree with. The second thing, Will, I'll say is, I think in terms of Mick needing to kind of change schematically, I think Mick also kind of needs to change emotionally as well. You know, he's, the thing that makes him such a great coach is his fire, his passion, uh, his standard of excellence and discipline on the defensive side. He's always been able to get the most out of his players through tough love, through really kind of holding players to a high level of accountability. And I think that's worked really well when you've had really seasoned kids like Jaime Jaquez Jr., like Tiger Campbell. And I think that's worked really well when you've got really talented guys like Jalen Clark and and like Amari Bailey and, and like Peyton Watson and guys, you know, with next level potential. I think here... Will, he may need to kind of dial it back a little bit and be a little bit more of a good cop moving forward. And I think he needs to kind of build these kids up because this group is just not quite as talented as some of those teams in years past. You know, the 21 Final Four run, last year's team was arguably the best team in the country in my mind. So there is a drop-off in talent. And so I think there's a schematic opportunity, to your point, whether that's kind of going more Houston Rockets or going more kind of point forward, but then I think there's kind of an emotional aspect with Mick where I think he needs to be more good cop moving forward. And you're starting to see some remnants of that the last couple of days at practice. He's been a lot more encouraging. There seems to be a lot more energy at practice, and he's building guys up more. So I'd love to see kind of this softer side of Mick for the second half of the year because I think this team responds more to positive reinforcement than the tough love. Yeah, and there's so many just wrenches thrown into this, right? So this team is learning how to play with each other because Ade yeah. Mara famously was not cleared until very, you know, very close to the opening start date of the season. And you got guys like Vide and Burke who have come into the program where this is their first taste of American culture, learning the language, learning how to communicate with your teammates, you know, with guys that have been here for a while. So chemistry takes a while to kind of pick up. And I think everyone speaks the same language on the basketball court. But famously, you need chemistry. You need to learn how to play with one another for things to work out. And I think that's really been the problem early in the season is not having those reps, not having those chemistries of learning, okay, this is when I get the ball in the post, he's going to cut because I know that's what he does on a daily basis. 
they're still kind of feeling each other out in a yep. lot of regards. So, you know, if we start peaking at the end of the season, maybe that'll be a very encouraging thing. But right now, it's tough. It's going to take some of these hard losses to build to some greater successes down the line. So really looking forward to seeing hopefully how they gel moving forward. Thursday night, we got a game against Utah, which I'm really excited about. Maybe we get together and watch that one, which would be a lot Absolutely. Of and I think you and I will be there Sunday for, for Washington as well. That's going to be we're, – we're the good luck charm, Will, that, uh, that they need to sort of get revived here again. And, Will, I think it's, it's such an interesting point because – I think sitting at six and nine, sitting at one and three in the conference, look, the Pac-12 was also a little bit of a weaker conference this year. So the chances of them making the NCAA tournament through a regular season run are pretty slim at this point. They, they're almost going to have to run the table, to be honest with you. I mean, it, they basically have to kind of win every game except for maybe at Arizona to sort of put together a resume. And I think even then, they're still probably a bubble team at that point, just given where the Pac-12 is, where the non-conference kind of netted out for UCLA. So to me, the way I think about this is there's about 12, 13 conference games from here on out. You got to use this as development and growth to start try to play your best basketball for early March because there is an automatic bid out there in the form of that Pac-12 tournament. And right now, this conference is Arizona and everybody else. And there's very much of a world where we've seen it every year where when there's a team that's kind of locked up a one seat in the regular season and they know they've got that NCAA tournament in a couple of days that are starting, they don't always sort of bring that 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 fastball, that A-plus game in that conference tournament. And that could very well be the case here this year. And so there's an automatic bid to be had if you can go, go on a three or four game run there against you know, no one else in the Pac-12 outside of Arizona is ranked in the top 25 right now. So if UCLA still uses these next 12, 13 games as a development opportunity and then really plays their best basketball in that Pac-12 tournament, there's still an opportunity to make an NCAA tournament berth, which I think would be a tremendous success for Mick, given all of the challenges this year, the roster construction and so forth. So I think that's how we need to be thinking about this season and phases. Yeah, I completely agree, man. Hopefully the phases, you know, favor us as we get closer and closer to March. So we'll keep tabs on that for you guys all throughout it. Tough week, I think, as a UCLA football fan as well. I mean, Marcus Radcliffe was one of the guys we're most excited about, you know, coming into the program. He went and took a visit to Texas A&M where eventually he flipped his commitment. He was one of the top rated safeties in the transfer portal. That was tough enough. And then yesterday, Jeremiah McClure, a guy that we watched in spring ball that I was very excited about. You know, we had Jerry Neuheisel on the show who was very excited about McClure. We had him on, uh, I think, last September before the season started. Um, a guy that's going to be transferring to San Diego State. So that's tough as well. We picked up a couple new commitments. Uh, you know, Jacob Busich from Navy. Uh, this is a guy that has one year of eligibility left. His best season was in 2022, eight and a half tackles for loss. Was largely injured last year. And, you know, we got another Ivy League guy, you know, uh, Joseph Vaughn from Yale, six foot three, 234 pounds, 88 tackles. I get it. But, man, he is going to a whole different brand of football. You know, I just it's tough because I think when everything is right at UCLA, I think this is a school and a program that can get the best of the best when it comes to the transfer for. We've proved that in the past. You know, your Charbonnets, your Latus, we've gotten them on campus. We've gotten them into the blue and gold. But. These guys don't really make a lot of difference. You know, I've seen the Jacob Sykes come in and he was a Harvard guy. You know, he was a rotational defensive tackle at best. Philip Heimlicker, the defensive end that came from Penn last year. You know, he's a nice rotational defensive end to throw out there when your Murphys and Latus got tired. I guess we're going to really see the fruits of that labor this season coming up. But, you know, I, I'm not I'm not ready to just say that these guys are going to be anything more than just a rotational player, just given what we've seen. Even Anthony Atkins, who may have, you know, his moment this year, which I'm excited about. Maybe Big Ten play, we open up the playbook a little bit for, for Atkins. It was just a lot of guys in the running back room. We just didn't even get to see him much. So, you know, what are your thoughts on what's transpired in the transfer portal and maybe how can we improve moving forward and making sure that UCLA is getting guys that are difference makers on the football field. Yeah, well, I think you said it best. You know, I think with Radcliffe, I'll start there because I think that's kind of the headliner here in terms of this situation. I had a feeling this was going to happen because even when he committed to UCLA, there was a sense that, hey, I'm committing right now. 
but I'm going to kind of keep my options open during the holidays and in the new year and kind of look for different nil packages. And there was a sense that we were probably going to lose him to a bigger nil package. So certainly disappointed with Radcliffe, but I can't say that I'm completely surprised at how it played out because I think, again, Texas A&M, just that revolving door of what they got going on, these mass exoduses and then people coming in, I think money's just flying around in both directions with with Texas A&M. I mean, it's sort of the wolf of Wall Street, the wolf of College Station, I think is happening over there uh, with that regard. In terms of some of the other additions that you mentioned, Will, I agree with you. They're incremental. These are these are rotational pieces. You know, you're adding some depth. At the end of the day, this sort of sounds more like an academic all-American list. You know, the list of the next U.S. senators. You know, in terms of universities like Yale and Harvard and UPenn and Navy and Elon and you know some of these schools, rather than you know folks that are going to come in and make a huge impact in terms of on the field production moving forward. I think that, you know, UCLA sort of picked their spots a little bit. I think again, not to, you know, sort of beat the dead horse here. I think Neil just continues to play a bigger and bigger role in terms of talent acquisition will. And I think to your point, when UCLA kind of has it right, there's no better school in America that can offer the complete package. But I think you know, we're still catching up in the nil game. And I think that's pretty evident both on the football side as well as on the basketball side with some of the things that Mick has been saying the last couple of weeks. So I think there's been a couple of rotational pieces here. I'm looking for this team, you know, with the new coaching staff to go get another Achi Empong, you know, and if they can kind of fortify another one or two kind of key pass rushers to sort of be able to really then feel like, hey, we've not reloaded because it's so hard to sort of replace a lot to an Murphy twins, but we're in a credible position where those guys now, those slots are accounted for with really credible players. And then combine that with another one or two very strong offensive line prospects. I think that's where UCLA kind of needs to focus two guys on the defensive line, two guys on the offensive line, and then be able to kind of round out the rest. Uh, given what's going to happen in the spring. Because for all those challenges, Will, I think we're seeing the importance of the trenches now more than ever. I think last night's game with with Michigan and Washington kind of showed you can have the flashiest of offenses and, you know, the most decorated quarterbacks and wide receiver trio. But this game is still won or lost in the trenches with great blocking, with great tackling, and with great toughness. And so I think UCLA's got to really focus there Uh, in terms of offensive and defensive line to get ready for the Big Ten. Because truthfully, Will, on the skill position side, whether you're talking about Garbers or you're talking about Harden or you're talking about hopefully Sturdivant comes back with Ford, with Flores, you know, there's guys there that can make plays. When you talk about kind of the back end, you still have Addison. You've still got guys on sort of the back end of the secondary. It really needs to be kind of a fortification on, on the offensive and defensive lines. Yeah, Davis and Kirkwood are uh, Jalen Davies and Kirkwood are likely coming back. But let me ask you this: I have this question. We did the college football playoff preview game, and Washington's offensive line was spectacular all year. Yep, I think they just went against a beast that was Michigan's. But what I noticed was how much time Michigan had in the pocket, and how open those running lanes were for guys. You know, the Donovan Edwards, Blake Corum, they had won the previous two Joe Moore awards. Do you think it was like voter fatigue? Because we talk about basketball all the time. LeBron should have a couple more MVPs. Kobe Bryant famously should have a couple more MVPs in his case. You know, Giannis, uh, Jokic, whoever you want to bring up. It seems like they get tired of the narrative and they vote elsewhere. I think it was very much that way because, to me, the best offensive line I saw last night, and granted, Washington's D-line isn't Michigan, but they have a couple future pros on there too, and Braylon Trice and uh, T- ZTP. Yes. You know, you think Michigan's offensive line was truly the best offensive line in that game? Absolutely. And I yeah. think it's always, Will, there's something about human nature where that third consecutive year, that voter fatigue kind of sets in. You know, you mentioned for the Shacks and the Kobe's, you know, it was, sometimes it was the second year. But even Jordan famously never won three straight MVPs. LeBron never won three straight MVPs, if you recall. There's something about human nature where it's like, okay, you know, we give you the two. We got to go in a different direction here. And it really felt that way last night, Will. I, I thought the offensive line of Michigan really dominated that game. I mean, when you look at the holes that Donovan Edwards had in the first 
part of that game. I mean, anyone could have gone through those holes. Those are sort of a straight line and a run. And then you saw kind of the big run Corum had early and then the big holes late. I thought Washington did a fairly decent job in the middle of the game to sort of hold it in. But I also think that Michigan almost went away from themselves and it almost fatally cost them. I think there were some moments in that game where they could have sort of really put the hammer down earlier and they kind of chose to throw instead of run. You know, they were up 14-3 and, you know, it was a third and four, they're throwing. You know, 17-3, they're on the Washington side of the field, they're throwing. You know, there was an opportunity to kind of really throw some haymakers there. And I actually thought it was going to kind of bite them late because, you know, we've seen so many times in college football when you have an opportunity to kind of go for the knockout and you don't do it and you keep a team alive, it could come back to bite you. But fortunately, in, in Michigan's case, that was certainly not. But you could see it on the offensive line and then, Will, on the defensive line. I mean, we yeah, have not seen Michael Penix Jr. just be that unnerved, you know. And sometimes that unnerving comes together. It doesn't always have to translate into sacks or tackles for loss because Michigan had a pretty modest day in terms of sacks as well as tackles for loss. But just the pressure the the pocket closing, kind of the relentless pressure that was coming, you could just see how unnerved Michael Penix Jr. was. He missed reads that he normally makes. He missed throws that he normally makes. And it was just really a function of never being comfortable, both in the pocket as well as with some really exceptional secondary play. So in this world of, you know, these decorated offenses and Kalen DeBoer and Steve Sarkeesian and the Lincoln Rileys and all of, Uh, you know, these offensive juggernauts, it shows, look who's been winning the championships the last few years. Michigan, hard-nosed Georgia the last couple of years with great trenches play. The Alabama teams with great trenches play. And so it's really showing that even as we're becoming more offensive-minded from a fan standpoint, from an analyst standpoint, from a media standpoint, the game of football hasn't changed. It's won on the offensive and defensive line. Yeah, man. It's always won through the trenches. And Washington, as I'm getting it from you, was the 98 Carl Malone to Michigan's Michael Jordan. Woo! Oh, they, that's oh, an elite go. reference there. You know, yeah, man. As, 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 as Mike would say, it's like, okay, you know, you, you gave him, you gave him the MVP fine, but I'm going to take this, you know? And so in that uh, box, by the way, of Michael Jordan, Derek Jeter, Travis Scott, and somehow Stephen A. Yeah. Stephen A. And Stephen, a, Stephen A. Smith with his, with his like letterman jacket was acting like the biggest celebrity there. Oh, I no, he, was hilarious, me, you know? <laughs> he annoys me with that stuff. I, I think he's necessary for sports media. I think he's great at his job. I really do. But when he kind of bigs it up like that, I mean, I, the famous one that I was, you know, laughing hysterically at was he was blaming Michael Rubin for not getting invited to that white party. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> You think these athletes want to see you when they're party? Like they do not, man. You're just gonna criticize them at the end of the day. So, like, and and by the way, you're not even in that class. So just like enjoy being the biggest sports talking head there is. Outside of that, man, there's not much there for you. Love Stephen A. Love this podcast, guys. Make sure you're tuning in. We'll have another one for you by the end of the week and be on ESPN radio on Friday. So stay tuned. We will be touch uh in touch very, very soon. Take it easy.